Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pallavi Fadnis. Uh, this is my teammate Snehal Nagmote. Uh, we are going to co-present in the talk today. Uh, hope you all enjoy watching Netflix. Uh, I am an avid user myself and I really enjoy working at Netflix. We both are from Consolidated Logging Team. Uh, our Consolidated Logging Team runs one of the largest filling applications in production at Netflix specifically the largest in terms of scale. So we are really excited to share about our use case today with all of you. So let's get started. Uh, so here is the agenda for uh, today's talk. Uh, I'll first start by giving you an overview of consolidated logging. Uh, then we'll take a look at you know, high level architecture of our log processing platform built on top of Flink. Uh, we'll then look into uh, the design aspects of the log processing application and I would like to share some interesting learnings we have had with the massive scale that we have. In the second half of the presentation, uh, my teammate Snehal is going to present about event extractor use case and related learnings. She will also touch upon uh, some operational aspects uh, and then she'll talk about the impact we were able to achieve with the Fling based platform. Uh, so what is consolidated logging? Oops. Uh, the goal of consolidated logging is to build an integrated solution to provide insights into user behavior and application performance metrics through client-side logging. So as you all can imagine, user behavior data, uh, that is all of the user interaction that happens on Netflix, uh, is a really important data set for us because insights into this data is what allows us to enhance our users' experience even further uh, in many different ways. So consolidated logging is a solution to capture user activity through client-side logging. There are, uh, there are many different use cases where uh, consolidated logging data is used to enhance user experience by analyzing user behavior. For example, uh, you know, providing more personalized experience to the users, providing right set of recommendations to the users, identifying the right feature for you know, better user en engagement through A-B experimentation, or improving the application performance, for example, time to render app. So these are some of the many use cases uh, where consolidated logging data is used. So, our team offers uh, consolidated logging as a solution to capture user activity through client-side logging, as I mentioned before. And it also offers a platform to process all of this data and make it available in analytics-ready format uh, uh, to, to power all these use cases downstream. Uh, I just want to add note that uh, going forward, I might refer to consolidated logging as CL. So keep in mind that CL is a short form for consolidated logging. <clears throat> now, there are many different platforms that Netflix users use to watch Netflix. Uh, the primary platforms are TV UI, website, Android, iOS, and there are some others as well. We want to log user behavior data in consistent format across all these platforms. Uh, so we have more than 300 event types defined in our schema. And with the new use, use cases, uh, we define uh, new event types and update the schema to capture user activity. Uh, there are multiple device platforms, as I mentioned, and multiple app versions uh, corresponding to these platforms that client devices run. Uh, newer versions of the app get rolled out periodically. So hopefully that gives you some idea about the complexity of consolidated logging. Now we have millions of users and millions of devices, so that leads to a huge scale. So we have like hundreds of billions of events per day, uh, or over a petabyte of user behavior data per day. Uh, our platform needs to process all of this data. So here is a, a high-level picture of uh, the CL platform. Uh, it's a de facto logging platform to address uh, different kinds of logging needs at Netflix. Uh, 
The primary use case it supports is uh, CL data from Netflix apps, which is all of the user activity from Netflix apps. That's the biggest data set. Uh, but in addition to that, it also supports other logging use cases. So all the application logs from internal tools as well as some other external applications. So the platform needs to support these different logging uh, use cases and corresponding specifications. Uh, the primary feature of the platform is to perform real-time data processing, uh, which involves data transformations as well as data enrichment uh, and making uh, the data available in unified output schema for downstream consumption. Uh, there are different sets of uh, downstream use cases. Some of them are uh, batch consumers. Some of them require you know, stream consumers, low latency. Low latency. So the platform needs to support different kinds of data sinks, uh, like Kafka, Hive, and Elasticsearch. Uh, last year, we migrated our uh, legacy pipeline uh, to the new Flink-based platform. Uh, events from client uh, land, uh, hit the landing service, and from there onwards, you know, there was like this series of uh, processing components, a long chain of processing components in the legacy pipeline, which was inefficient and it involved uh, duplicate processing. So we unified it into Fling-based platform. Uh, the, the new platform is much more efficient and offers a bunch of benefits that Snehal is going to talk about uh, later in the end. Uh, so if some of you are considering migrating your uh, legacy stream processing pipeline, which looks, looks like this, to Flink, uh, we would uh, definitely recommend it. The Flink-based platform consists of two components, CL app, uh, which is the generic log processing application, uh, and event extractor. Uh, event extractor provides managed data sets on top of consolidated logging data for downstream batch and stream consumers. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about a CL app, and then later Snehal will present about event extractor. Uh, all right, so let's look at the features of CL app. Uh, it's a generic log processing application to support different logging use cases. So it needs to support uh, different logging specifications or schemas corresponding to uh, the different use cases. It performs real-time processing, which involves applying a series of data transformations on the incoming logging events to, uh, to provide uh, them in uh, analytics-ready format for consumption. In addition to transformations, it also performs data enrichment. So it enriches incoming logging events with additional information, uh, such as uh, users' membership information, geo information, and device type information. Uh, so it performs joins or lookups uh, with dimensional data uh, that can be done using microservices and other approaches. It provides single source of truth with unified output schema for downstream consumption. It supports two different data sinks, Kafka and Hive. And in terms of SLA, the throughput that it supports is 3.5 million events per second at peak and the latency is below three milliseconds. <clears throat> so now let's, uh, let's look into some key design uh, points. Uh, CL app is a stateless Flink application. It provides uh, at least once processing guarantee. For isolation of concerns, uh, specifically you know, concerns around back pressure situations, the way we have de designed it is we have separate fling jobs for different logging use cases as well as different sync types. But all of these fling jobs use a common log processing framework as a library. So because the processing logic or business logic is common between all these different logging use cases. So uh, the fling job DAGs differ based on the use case, but they use common framework library. So for example, you know, for the use case of uh, Netflix app user behavior data, the job DAG is FANIN, where we have multiple input uh, Kafka topics uh, where uh, events are segregated based on platform. But the job writes to a single sync uh, with a unified output schema. 
on the other hand, for the use case of you know, internal tool logs, uh, it's a fan out where uh, it's a single input source uh, topic uh, because the scale of the data is small, but the job routes events to a specific you know, data sync corresponding to a specific internal tool. So uh, the DAG is a uh, fan out. Uh, this is a high-level design diagram of the common lock processing framework that I talked about. Uh, so I'll go through the key components and the data flow here. Uh, lock consumer consumes raw logging events from Kafka. Uh, spec parser, depending on the request type and version, identifies the schema logging schema for the event, and it is able to parse the event based on the schema. Uh, when we onboard new use cases onto our platform, as a part of the onboarding process, uh, the user subscribes uh, for the kind of data enrichment it needs for the logging use case, the kind of transformations it needs, and also uh, the sync configuration. So all of that is configuration driven, and configuration is keyed by source name. So the framework, uh, depending on the incoming logging event, identifies the source of the event looks up the configuration and applies specific set of data enrichments, data transformations, and then routes it to the corresponding sync uh, based on configuration. Uh, all right, so that was about the design of the CL app. Uh, now I would like to share some interesting learnings we have had while running this job in production and some practices that we follow. Uh, <clears throat> for the scale that we need, the throughput that we need, which is 3.5 million events per second, uh, we have a really high parallelism over 2,000. So it's, a, it's an embarrassingly parallel uh, job uh, with, high, uh, with parallelism over 2,000. In order to achieve uniform CPU utilization, uh, we use high number of partitions on the source Kafka topic. So we have 7,200 partitions on the source Kafka topic. And then with the parallelism of 2000, you know, we are able to achieve uniform CPU utilization while uh, making sure that we achieve the throughput that we need. Uh, with high parallelism, we actually ran into a couple of uh, critical issues. Uh, so one of the issues we ran into a few months ago was high memory pressure and GC pause on job manager. Uh, so I'll describe the symptoms of this issue uh, first. Uh, so because of high memory pressure and GC pause on the job manager, the job manager would become uh, unhealthy or unresponsive. And as a result, uh, uh, in order to recover, it will lead to the restart of the application. Uh, and that would sort of trigger this uh, you know, recovery failure restart loop. Uh, so this was caused because of two issues. Uh, there was a memory leak bug in the job manager. So thanks to the open source community for fixing this bug. Uh, other issue was uh, scaling bottleneck of Kafka sources union state. Uh, so Flink also provided a short term fix for this for us. So uh, let me describe it in a, in a little bit detail. So uh, Kafka source uses union state of all the partitions when automatic partition discovery is enabled. Now, because we have 7,200 partitions, like large number of partitions on the input Kafka topic, uh, the size of this union state becomes really large in GBs. Uh, and job manager has to, oh, looks like there is a technical glitch. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, so the size of the union state becomes really large because of high number of partitions, and the job manager has to ship this large state across to all the 2,000 subtasks that are running in the job. So that puts pressure on the network and uh, on the job manager. Uh, so the short-term fix that worked for us is to use Kafka sources. Uh, is to use Kafka sources. Uh, partitionable state when automatic partition discovery is uh, disabled. Uh, another challenge we ran into with high parallelism was uh, overwhelmed coordinator uh, due to thundering herd problem. Uh, so uh, again, you know, we have, uh, so Flink uh, creates one Kafka consumer instance per subtask. 
Now, because we have 2,000 subtasks running in the job, what happens is during the Kafka consumer initialization, all of these 2,000 Kafka consumer instances try to fetch the committed offset from uh, the same coordinator roughly around the same time. And that uh, overwhelms the coordinator. So, and on top of that, that actually there was a sneaky bug in Kafka where uh, the consumer uh, gets stuck in a loop and it's not able to uh, initialize. So this actually leads to a stuck consumer where a few of the Kafka consumer instances are stuck and they are not able to make any progress or not able to read uh, any data from the partitions. Uh, so the fix that our platform team provided for this was uh, introducing a jittering mechanism uh, in Kafka consumer initialization. So uh, because of this jittering during Kafka consumer initialization, what happens is all these 2,000 Kafka consumer instances do not bombard the coordinator at the same time, uh, and that helped us resolve this uh, stuck consumer issue. <clears throat> Data compression is also a factor to consider. Uh, this is something we didn't anticipate uh, before. So when we uh, migrated our, from our legacy pipeline to the Flink-based platform, we noticed that the data compression ratio was worse in Kafka. It was four times worse in Kafka. Uh, and also um, uh, in Parquet, or high, high warehouses in Parquet format. Uh, it turned out that this was due to upstream uh, Kafka producer batching difference. So uh, the upstream Kafka producer batching mechanism changed, and that increased data entropy, and that led to worse compression. So after fixing the batching mechanism upstream, the compression ratio improved. So uh, I mean, as you can see here, uh, after fixing the batching mechanism, the compressed volume came back down. Um, if you are uh, performing data enrichment from your Flink application, which involves calling external microservices, then uh, you know, keep in mind that a huge backlog in Kafka and you know, if, uh, if you have like auto scaling enabled, it can lead to sudden load on uh, external services. So you might need to implement throttling to rate limit the API calls. <clears throat> uh, another issue that we occasionally run into in production is uh, Kafka back pressure situations. So the application is not able to produce to Kafka uh, because of uh, infrastructure issues such as you know, outlier broker or uh, leader election failure. Uh, because of this, what happens is uh, we have like a lot of task failures in the uh, Flink application. And since we uh, do at least once processing, it leads to uh, duplicate events. Um, so we have set aggressive alerts on Kafka infrastructure issues to identify it sooner in order to reduce the number of duplicate events produced. Uh, lastly, you know, this is a minor thing, but we uh, also ran into some juice dependency injection conflicts with Flink, uh, that is some jar conflicts for Spring. And if you run into similar uh, issue, Flink documentation has some guidelines around it. So uh, Flink by default inverts class loading order, uh, and that can be changed by setting this parameter class loader resolve order to parent first. So that's all I have about the, uh, oops. All right, that's all I had about the learnings we have had while running, building and running CL app in production. And now I'm going to call upon Snehal to present further about Event Extractor. Hello, thank you Pallavi. Hi everyone, my name is Snehal. I work with Pallavi on Consolidated Logging team. Today I'm going to talk about Event Extractor, a Fling-based platform which we built to provide managed data sets for our consumers. So in today's talk, I'll talk about Event Extractor use case, design, some of the challenges and learning we had while productionizing this pipeline, and lastly, I'll talk about impact and benefits of this platform. So quick show of hands, how many of, you's, uh, how many of you use Netflix? Well, quite a few. So let me go over the use case for Event Extractor. So I, I will summarize what Pallavi talked about CL data pipeline to set context. In CL, 
we collect user clicks, searches, application performance metrics, and impressions. And this data flows through CLAP data pipeline, where we transform and enrich it to make it available for analytics ready format. So once this data is available in Kafka, what do we do with this data? So we have many consumers who would like to consume this data to build their uh, use cases. For instance, personalization pipeline uses this to power trending now algorithms. Search pipeline uses this to improve search results. Impression pipelines also like to use this data to further improve and tune impression algorithms. At Netflix, we are a data-driven company, and we do extensive A-B testing to improve user experience. So our A-B experimentation pipeline is one of the biggest consumer of this data. We also use this pipeline uh, to do exploratory analysis for several different use cases. We also have consumer insight pipeline who uses this data to build customer service tools to help answer any questions related to customer support. So this is the screenshot of Keystone and how our consumers were uh, consuming this data for CL data pipeline. I think many of you are already familiar with Keystone. Uh, it, is a, it is a backbone of Netflix real-time data infrastructure, and it's built by our amazing platform team. Many of them are all also present in the conference. So uh, high level, Keystone provides two services, data pipeline, and, subs, um, and it provides the Flink platform as a service. So as part of data pipeline, user can build uh, filters, which is basically a Flink application on top of Kafka streams. Since many of our users were interested in consuming specific data set, they would use this pattern uh, to consume the data. So each of these filter is a Flink streaming application. Now there were a few issues with uh, consuming this data for CL data pipeline, because our scale is too high. We process 3.5 million events per second globally at peak, and that results into hundreds of billions of events per day. With this pattern, we were reading the same data multiple times. So that means it was actually causing compute redundancy. Also, over time, we onboarded so many consumers that it became difficult to scale existing Kafka infrastructure for outgoing bytes. And we started copying the same data into a different Kafka topics to enable the same pattern for our consumers. And this pipeline had high compute and operational cost. So we replaced this Keystone routes for CL with an event extractor, which is a single Flink application, which read data once and routes it to multiple sinks. So what is event extractor? It's a stateless job. It can read data once, and it applies the configuration-driven processing and routes it to multiple streams. So to onboard new config, I don't need to do any code change. Functionality-wise, uh, we have support for filter, transformation, and projections. So user can also express SQL queries uh, to express the filter expression. We also provide out-of-box metrics for our users. Now let's look into how user can actually interact with event extractor. So currently, uh, we store all of our user configurations in YAML. Uh, our configs are managed in version control. So once user submit a new config he is interested in, uh, we update that in S3 via batch data pipeline, uh, and that S3 is actually input to an event extractor. So this is one of the example config. Uh, event extractor expects config to be in certain format. In filter expression, uh, user can write SQL queries. So filter expression is nothing but the where clause of your SQL query. Via projection expression, uh, user can specify set of fields he wants to consume from the stream. So transformation has support for passing nested JSON and making it high level or top level field. In sync details, uh, we have capability to route this data to Kafka, Hive, or Elasticsearch. Owner name is something we use for bookkeeping. And route name is used for publishing metrics for that particular user config. 
This is a high level design for event extractor. So it mainly has three components. We have config reader, which reads this user configs and creates the dynamic DAG. It also builds the POJO out of those configs, and these POJOs get passed to filter, transmission, and projection operators so that they can do the configuration driven processing. Schema builder creates the thin layer of schema over the streaming data. Since we have support for uh, writing SQL queries in filter expression, we use SQL parser to evaluate that expression. And lastly, uh, we have support for routing data to Elasticsearch, Hive, or Kafka, and this, this is basically taken care by libraries. Now, there were a few challenges with the design of the event extractor. That how do we scale this single Flink applications since uh, we decided to process all the configuration in the single job? So I have to pay attention to certain configs related to fan out and CPU utilization and Kafka lag metrics to make sure I'm keeping up with the incoming data. Also, many of our users were interested in consuming data from Kafka or Hive. So we wanted to make sure the failures in Kafka doesn't impact our Hive consumers. So we do deployment per sync type to achieve the isolation. With this pattern, we also made a conscious choice where pack pressure would be shared between multiple consumers. So to minimize the impact of that, uh, we create the consumer Kafka topics in the same cluster. We also do extensive canaries and testing before onboarding new config to make sure it doesn't really impact the existing configuration in production. We also had fair share of learning while running this application in production, and I would like to share a few of them uh, with you. So one of the issues I ran into is uh, buildup of network pressure used to cause S3 checkpoint failures due to socket timeouts. And when this used to happen, Java will go into the restart loop. So we store checkpoints in uh, S3, and this is again taken care by our platform provided libraries. So we noticed that uh, S3 objects were not getting garbage collected. So they added a fix where they added a support for better G1 GC and increased S3 timeouts. I also had to uh, do tuning with S3 checkpoint uh, because I had a high fan out. And this helped us to resolve the issue. Another important thing to look at is uh, if you are running high parallelism job, you have to tune your parallelism to avoid unbalanced CPU utilization. So we found that setting parallelism in multiples of Kafka partitions and task slots helped us to achieve better CPU utilization. Another issue our downstream Kafka consumer reported was uh, he was using watermark assigner to progress the high watermark and apparently it needs continuous stream of records uh, in all the partitions for Kafka topic. And this is actually an open issue in Flink. And we were using sticky partitioner, which can actually skip producing data to out of sync partitioner. So setting min, uh, sticky partitioner min qualified ISR ratio to one helped us to produce data even to out of sync partitions. And this helped us uh, with producing continuous stream to progress the high watermark. One of the most common issue we see uh, in production for all of our streaming application is basically outlier container or broker, and that can happen due to bad hardware. And when this happens, consumer can get nonlinear traffic pattern. And this results into a stuck consumer alert. What that means is um, some of the partitions are not making progress at the same rate as other partitions, and your application will lag. So we have extensive alerts set on this, and to take care of it, we kill these containers specifically. This can also happen when there is an outlier broker in your Kafka. And when this happens, your producer will throw patch expired timeout exceptions and increase in checkpoint failures. And if this happens for a period of time, uh, it can introduce duplicates for downstream Kafka consumers. Again, to catch these situations, we set alerts on it and then take respective action. Now let's go into some of the op operational aspects of the streaming application. 
So we use Keystone, which is a sub-sub UI uh, for deployment of streaming applications. It is really one click button where we can specify a jar and it takes care of the underlying container management for our applications. It, pro it also provides the out of box Elasticsearch log stash, Kibana support for applications log, so that we can, it helps us in debugging any issues quickly. With Keystone, we also get uh, some of the alerts um, out of box and that integration is with, with Atlas. For deployment, we use a minimized duplicate deployment strategy. So we store checkpoints in S3. So when our application actually starts from failures, it actually starts from last successful checkpoint. For the restart strategy, we use fine-grained recovery mechanism. What that means is if there are task failures, we lean towards only restarting those tasks rather than restarting the complete application. Since our application is stateless, we can do this but if it's a stateful job, you may have to lean towards having the full job restarts because some of the operators are dependent upon the output of previous operators. Now let's look into some of the monitoring and alerting. So for the scope of presentation, I'll only go over a few important metrics. So one of the important metrics to look at is parallel task failures. And uh, there could be tasks failed, and it can happen due to a business logic issues or infrastructure issues. Restarts is another important metric to look at. It will tell you how many job restart your application is having. With respect to recovery, a few of the important metrics to look at is checkpoints failed. Uh, checkpoint size and checkpoint duration is also important metric. Another metric we look at is the consumer lag. It is very important to uh, monitor this metric to make sure that your application is uh, producing data within SLA. In addition to these metrics, we also have a lot of custom metrics for our application specific logic. In the context of event extractor, um, we have few metrics like how many events were processed by process for each user config, how many errors were there in, in filter or transmission operations. We also capture how many events were dropped while doing the filter for different user configs. Now this platform provided us a lot of benefits. So with new pi pipeline, we were able to achieve reduced data loss. Since we replaced the SQS in legacy pipeline with Kafka, and it can handle large payloads compared to legacy pipeline. With new pipeline, we are also able to reduce cost and, uh, and reduce operational overhead. With event extractor, we decommission almost 13 fling streaming jobs with one job. And it resulted into 60% of cost saving. With CLF, we also improved data processing because we replace that long chain of processing with streamlined components and we reduce the point of failures. CLAP also helped us to achieve the schema consistency across CL components and we also store this data in our data warehouse. So that's all I had. Thank you for joining everyone. And now we'll open up for questions. Hello. Uh, what's the typical event size for your log data? You said that you were able to handle 4 million records per second. Um, so let me repeat the question. So what is the event size for the log data? Yeah. Um, it's like, it's in, it's in KBs like around, it's like around 15 KB max per event. Yeah. I think there is a question. Oh, there is a question. Hey, uh, I imagine that, um, so you had a configuration-based uh, um, logic and the extractor. 
Um, I imagine that it was implemented not through SQL uh, processing, but rather APIs, right? Um, uh, and so that's the question. And also, um, do, you, do, do you support also like grouping by, or is it strictly stateless? And if you do support grouping by, how, how would you go about doing that on the operators in terms of like dynamic configurations? So the question is, uh, in event extractor, we do configuration-driven processing. And whether it's uh, expressed via SQL or whether we use the underlying APIs to do that, right? And second question is, uh, is the event extractor stateless? Or uh, if we want to make event extractor stateful, uh, what would be the concerns and how we would be able to do that? So the answer to the first question is, um, yes, uh, we do configuration-driven processing. Uh, we don't use Flink SQL APIs right now. Um, we use thin layer of uh, SQL JEP, which is basically we use the Java expression parser to parse the SQL expressions. And uh, with that, we use all the data stream APIs for doing filter, transformations, and projections. Uh, second answer to second question is, yes, event extract is stateless. And uh, if you want to make event extractor stateful, uh, as in the group pi, then I think uh, it would be a little tricky uh, because then um, uh, it makes the job deck more complex when there are uh, there is one user config which which is probably stateful and other configs are you know not doing that heavy lifting. So I think running that uh, job deck in production would have different consequences, mainly in terms of recovery and also making sure the application is healthy and keeping up with the traffic. So that's something we need to think about. So in that scenario, probably having one Flink application for each stateful application, that pattern would make sense. Thank you. OK. Uh, I, have, uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Um, one of them is, uh, for data enrichment, uh, what were the trade-offs you noticed between using uh, something like a microservice um, or a broadcast state? Um, and second question is, um, with your particular um, problem with the union state, um, a naive question I have is, would that problem still occur if you had a keyed topic and a keyed uh, state for your job processors? Uh, OK, so, so the first question is about data enrichment, what our experience was uh, with using microservices. Um, yeah, so. <clears throat> the challenges uh, with using uh, microservices to perform data enrichment is to make sure that we uh, maintain the SLA in terms of you know, latency. Uh, so in order to you know, uh, make sure that we optimize I.O., we have, we have to use like a caching layer and also perform API call at the batch level instead of per event in order to reduce the load on the external service. Uh, and another possibility is to also use like something like async IO. Um, so uh, right now, you know, in, when, in our use cases for doing data enrichment, uh, it was just one of the uh, cases uh, for geo enrichment is where we were using uh, microservices based lookup. And now we have moved to another approach. Uh, so yeah, so that is about, you know, uh, and we need to also make sure, as I mentioned, uh, is to rate limit the API calls in order to not load the external service with higher higher uh, volume than anticipated. Uh, for the other question about a uh, union state for uh, uh, keyed state, uh, I'm, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, so in our case, it's a stateless application. And uh, the way we fixed it is uh, by disabling automatic partition discovery it allows us to use partitionable state instead of union state. Uh, yeah. There's one last question over here. I have a question about the, the measuring the data loss. You mentioned in that the CL platform has helped to reduce the data loss in the pipeline. How do you measure the data loss, especially in the Flink application? Could you repeat the question? Oh, the, the question is about how do you measure the data loss in the CL platform? Yeah. So uh, the question is how do we actually identify data loss or, uh, or manage the data loss? Uh, you mentioned in the slide saying the data loss is improved, right, comparing to use Keystone, right? 
Right. Yeah. I think, uh, so. yeah, okay, the, uh, the context uh, I was talking about was earlier legacy pipeline. We are using SQS. And um, when, the, when events land into the landing service, uh, it had a huge payload. And SQS is not able to handle those large payloads, so it used to drop data. And we replaced that legacy pipeline with Kafka, which, which, is, which is able to handle those large payloads. So that's how we reduce the data loss. Uh, and also in the, in the legacy pipeline, we did not have good error handling. So in the new platform, we have better error handling. And that way, we are able to uh, reduce data loss in the new platform as compared to old. Uh, and it, to ensure, uh, we have at least once processing, as I mentioned, and uh, to ensure that there is no data loss, we have uh, like end-to-end -end, uh, monitoring to make sure that uh, uh, in, uh, incoming rate and out outgoing rate uh, matches. Okay, I think the time is over. Thanks a lot for this really great talk. Um, <laughs>